Okay, uh, we are continuing now to the last section of the paper, A Prophet Behind the Plough of Steiner Torvaldsson, giving us a life insight into the life and ministry of Hans Nielsen Hauke, using a lot of his own words. So there's a lot of power here. We're on page 14, and uh, we are in the middle of a quote which he gave at the end of his life. I think we're just going to start that quote again. I confess, therefore, that which is my utter conviction, my true experience and conviction in my inner being. I am 52 years old and have tasted Christianity's joy and strength, which had enabled me to leave my father's house and to offer up my body's peace and my worldly goods. I have put my life in danger of death many times wandered alone through and over many wild woods and fields woods and fields other times i have been among unfamiliar people and tested what it is to want and to have excess i have seen many loathsome forms of sin but in all this nothing has been able to disturb the peace and the divine joy i have through the teaching of christendom that is at one with my consciousness in that I only want to live according to its command. My heart has held to this alone. I have confidently surrendered myself to God's leading and protection, and He has been my secure refuge. Yes, I can assure you, my dear fellow men, that I in the darkest of prisons, where I have sat for my testimony's sake, right here have I had the spiritual joys that exceed all of the world's glory and joy. I also testify you, testify to you by the all-knowing God at nothing, absolutely nothing, that nothing, absolutely nothing has given people true happiness and peace with the strength to live a pure life than the faith Jesus preached. In a miraculous way, power is granted to all those who receive it in their inner being, such that their souls become sanctified by his reconciliation. From this flows that purity and that friendship that far exceeds all other morals and friendships in the world. Let us hasten after this grace and be united in true faith. Only then are we truly happy. Let it happen. Follow Jesus. Hauke spent his last years on a farm near Christiana. Here he wrote books, preached the word, gave advice and cultivated the earth. In his Testament to My Friends, written at this time, Hauge bade the Haugians to remain within the Lutheran Church, and he stressed the importance of living by God's Word. Many people came to speak with Hauge, including bishops and priests. When one of the bishops saw Hauge bent in his body, he later had to admit that Hauge had suffered for Christ's sake. Some months before he died, Hauge experienced a further spiritual renewal, in a letter to his friends he wrote, This last Sunday I experienced a powerful effect in my heart that I have not known in such a living way for many years. Towards the end of his life, Hauge was bedridden. Nevertheless, when he heard that people had come to visit him, he asked for his clothes. He was led to a sofa and visitors came in. Then he began to talk with a very quiet voice. I am weak now, my friends. I think that I will soon be separated from you. I hope my time is passing. God has been good to me. After a teacher had sung a spiritual song, Hauke picked up the Bible, read a chapter, and preached powerfully such that his illness was unnoticeable. When he had finished, he sank down onto the sulphur again and requested that he be helped back to his bed. Early in the morning, some weeks later, Hauke died, almost 53 years old. The last words that came from his lips were, Follow Jesus, O oh, you are the eternal loving God. Community based projects. The Haugian revival had a positive effect not only in the spiritual situation in Norway, but also in the economic, social, and political arenas. The Haugians became the first people's movement in Norway that was organized independently of the state. This network was undoubtedly one factor that contributed to Haugian success in the community and in business. Officials who had been among Hauge's most staunch opponents later attested to Haugian's good conduct. In many cases, this was because everywhere that Hauge's movement advanced, drunkenness retreated. 
There were three Haukians at the assembly of the notables in Eidsvold in 1814, and in a letter to his friends in October 1814, Hauger wrote proudly that four of our brothers are in the Storting, and have helped form our kingdom's constitution. The influence of Haugians was great in Parliament, in the Parliament of the 19th century. The Haugian revival was first and foremost a farmer's revival, and it is therefore reasonable to find traces of its effect in the livelihood they were involved in. All Norwegian historians are in agreement that there was an increase in productivity in Norwegian agriculture in the first half of the 1800s. A source of this is the Haugian farmers who overcame the apathy of traditionalism with new ideas and independent thinking. The country districts that were stationary in terms of development and lacking in any impulse to do so were set in action by the Haugian movement. Due to Hauger's background in farming, the farmers identified with him and the suggestions he produced. In this way, a slow modernization and reorganization took place in agricultural practices. During his many journeys, Hauger got a very good insight into Norwegian geography and economic conditions. He knew how to convert this knowledge into practical action. His thought was that good Christian practice led to busy hands and economic enterprise. Hauger had a unified view of life, which faith and everyday life belong together, in which faith and everyday life belong together. He combined the seeds of faith with the seeds of enterprise. One should be, one should be as he said, God's child in all necessary tasks. Hauger had good organizational abilities and started a series of business concerns including a corn shipping business in Bergen, a paper factory at Eike and at Fenefos, a brickworks at Eik in Kristiansand, a printer shop and newspaper in Kristiansand, a mill in Sandfjord and in Strutshaven near Bergen. The, the Solberg spinning work in Drammen is still in operation today. In the famine of 1809, Hauger was set free from prison to establish various salt works. Salt was important because it was the only preserving medium people had in those days. Later, despite his status as a prisoner, he was appointed as the public administrator of the poor fund in Christiana. Such was Hauger's reputation as an honest and successful organizer. The Haugian revival also created a thirst for knowledge. The desire to read and to go to school was strengthened by the people wanting to read Hauger's books and the Bible. Hauger produced 17 books, the combined number of copies issued being estimated at somewhere between 200,000 and 250,000. For a long time Hauger was the country's most well-read author, even though the books were imperfect in style and form. The openness and warmth in his writing appealed to his readers. Hauger's books inspired other people to write, there being 70 registered Haugian authors in the early 18th century. Well, early 19th century. Grendal and Dreyer, Norway's country's oldest publishing firm, and was founded by the Haugian Christopher Grendal in 1812. Hauger, Hauger also showed he valued education by giving financial support to help found the university in Christiana. The Haugian movement encompassed the whole of Norway and this resulted in the perspective of the farming community being lifted from local to national level. This eventually led to the integration of the farming community and factory workers into the political life of the emerging nation as was reflected in the formation of various political parties that subsequently became represented in the Storting. The Haugians worked in a visionary and holistic way. Gradually they caused spiritual renewal in a large part of the inner life of the church in Norway and their example, their example formed an important foundation for voluntary Christian work. The priests held the Haugians at a distance until 1850s, the 1850s. Then the Haugian movement changed from form and built up the new inner mission and overseas missionary movements that had begun to spring up in Norway. All these factors indicate that Hans Nielsen Hager had a great influence on Christian life of the Norwegian nation. Bibliography. I'll give you the publications in English which are here. We have H. Ording, Hans Nielsen Hager. Oh, I'll give you the, the, uh, the uh, publications in English. Alf J. Magnus. Revival and Society, an Examination of the Haugian Revival, 
and its influence on Norwegian society in the 19th century. Magister Thesis in Sociology at University of Oslo, 1978. You can see that on our website at www.duo.universityofoslo.no University of Oslo, Alison Heather Stibb, or Heather Stibb Allison. Hans Nielsen Helga and the Prophetic Imagination, PhD, University of London, 2007. You can also find that on the internet at discovery.ucl.ac.uk. One five four three oh. Lauren Cunningham, the book that transforms nations. YWAM Publishing, two thousand and seven. There he is, Hans Nielsen Hauger. This is the only official portrait of him from his time. The only original portrait. Or the only known original portrait from 1800. Okay, Yakwa be with you. May this be a blessing to you, this life we have shared of Hans Nielsen Helga. And may he become a prophetic model for our generation. In Jesus' name. Amen.